from Microbe TV. This is Tuivo, This Week in Evolution, episode number 83, recorded on October 11th, 2022. Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nels Eldi. Hey, Vincent. Good to be with you from LD Lab Studios. Um, recording live, but not live streaming today like we have been recently. We had a great opportunity, an um, uh, interesting guest who's bringing some fun news of an evolutionary event happening on the pages of the renowned journal Current Biology. And so couldn't miss this opportunity to uh, have this conversation. Um, unfortunately, couldn't quite line it up live with our um, live streaming audience from around the world, but I hope everyone will tune in and um, enjoy this and, and have some patience for the live streaming ahead. How are things going for you, Vincent? Oh, well, nice full weather here. Clear blue skies. Gorgeous. Beautiful. Good day to spread your wings and fly. And Ooh, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> that brings us to our topic. So um, let me, without further ado, introduce our guest. This is Florian Matisbacher, who is a senior editor at Current Biology. Hey, Florian, welcome to the Twivo. Hi, Nels, and hi, Vincent. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a great honor, of course, to be on in this uh, show that is mainly present in my house in the form of a coffee mug. Ah, <laughs> so very good. And finally get to experience the real thing. <laughs> That's right. You've got the swag, but it's time to sort of put yeah. your money where the mouth is and yes. share some evolution with us today. So you guys are neighbors, I understand, in Salt Lake City, right? Yeah, so we probably should give away our secret right here at the beginning. So, oh, oh. Um, yeah, why don't you say the story, Florian, of how you ended up in Salt Lake City? Uh, I ended up there because I got dragged uh, there by the love of my life. <laughs> and um, since I'm in that for fortunate position that my job is kind of mobile, so all I need is really my laptop and my connection to my teams in mm. London and, and Boston and Seattle. Um, my wife, whom I met through my job, it's very unromantic, editor meets budding young scientist. <laughs> but I met her in no other place than Salt Lake City many years ago at a conference where we both, uh, you know, I talked to her at her poster, we had a mutual friend and we went skiing in Salt Lake City and the rest is history, as they say. And when she was going on the job market, she said, hey, there's an opening in Salt Lake City. Wouldn't that be romantic? <laughs> I said, I said, no, it would not be romantic. Yeah. <laughs> the Mississippi is the line. I'm not going beyond that. Well, and here we are, you know, we moved here we are, and it's uh, been happy. And Nels yeah. has been one of the perks, of course, of being in Salt <laughs> Yeah, this has been happy for me too. So being three blocks away from Florian, I think we can let the cat out of the bag here. So Florian's partner, his wife is Sophie Carone, who runs a very successful a neurobiology laboratory using the model system Drosophila here in the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Utah. So, Vincent, this was like more than um, killing two birds with one stone, as the saying goes. This is like yeah. um, an absolute shot in the arm for science here on several levels for our community here in Salt Lake City. It sounds like well, we need to get uh, her on this week in neuroscience. <laughs> Absolutely. And a colleague with Jason Shepard. So we can, we already yeah. have these like local connections here all the way, th running all the way through somehow. Yeah. So we'll, Florian, we'll do a deeper dive on your background. I think our listeners will be really interested to hear about your journey through science and becoming an editor um, of a major scientific journal um, that um, I have to say, Vincent, I'm a, a huge fan of current biology. So this is, you know, covers exciting biology across the board, including a lot of evolution. Um, and so that's what brings us together today uh, on this episode is Florian has been spearheading a special issue. So current biology does this from time to time. They pick a topic, a broad topic, and then bring together scientists who are tackling this kind of from different settings, different frameworks, and 
today's topic or the upcoming topic releasing this week as we release this podcast is on birds. And so um, from an evolutionary standpoint, you know, birds are very conspicuous, spectacular beasts that sort of inspire our thoughts about the evolutionary process and have some features that are really can teach us about the evolutionary process across the board. And that's in big evidence here in the special of current bio, special issue of current biology. Florian, is it true that this um, issue is going to be available, the, um, open access for the first week of its publication, so our listeners can do a deeper dive? A large part of the articles are, uh, are a, a large part of the special issue articles, which are all front matter articles. So it's a bit different from other special issues where there's uh, always also uh, papers that are uh, research papers. Um, this is all front matter articles in various formats, so different kinds of review type articles, but also very short introductory uh, type articles. And so a large chunk of those, about, uh, I want to say more than half of those are free or so, or half, yeah, probably around half of those are free for the first two weeks. So absolutely dive in right away. The issue comes out on uh, Monday the 23rd of October goes live on 10 Eastern, 10 a.m. Eastern time. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah, perfect. And there's, you know, Vincent, there's too much ground for us to cover here. But so we've picked uh, three articles, three uh, review and two uh, primers. Do you, primers or primers? What's the correct Primers, terminal? we call it. Primers, primers. okay. Primers. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I got hell for that on TWIV, you know. Oh, geez, yeah. <laughs> uh, get our terminology correct here. Um, yeah. So we'll cover these in a little bit of detail today, but we can't even, even with these three, there's just, you know, so much depth to the work here. The reviews are putting in context the field here as evolutionary biologists are thinking about the diversity of birds around us. So big recommendation to, to go deeper, but think of maybe today's episode as we have a conversation with Florian as sort of a tasting menu of all of the uh, sort of fascinating biology right before our eyes. So I'll do a quick preview of the ground we'll be covering from the issue. And then I think we'll take, we'll kind of pause and actually um, spend some time talking to you, Florian, about your journey through science here. So the articles that we'll cover on today's podcast are the genomics of adaptation in birds. This is a review by um, Leonardo Campagna. Sorry, Vincent, you're gonna have to help me here with the pronunciation. Campagna, Campagna. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> and uh, David Toes. So, um, Leonardo Campagna is at Cornell and David Toes is at Penn State University, uh, Department of Ecology and Evolution there, um, talking about the genomics of adaptation in birds. So this is like actually the genome structure can kind of be instructive for how evolution might unfold, how, how the sort of template matters here as um, sort of natural selection writes over the mutations that arise um, in that sense. Our second article is on flightless birds. This was written by Florian himself. And so I think we'll probably spend a little uh, more time. It's really sort of an impressive um, deep dive into flightless birds um, and uh, comprehensive, I have to say there, Florian. You, like That looked like it must have taken some effort to put, pull this off. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then finally, the passerine birds. So the sparrows and sparrow-like birds. This is a really great primer from Jonathan Schmidt, and Scott Edwards, who are both at the Department of Organismal and Evolutionary Biology in the Museum of Comparative Biology at Harvard University in Boston. And Vincent, you know, um, we, we've been trying to get Scott Edwards on the podcast um, and still working on that. But in the meantime, we had a pick of the week back in episode 61 of Twivo. And this was an, an interview in Audubon magazine because Scott Edwards was biking across the U.S., biking across America uh, in support of uh, promoting diversity and evolution. And so we've got a couple show links here that we're including. Catch up with that interview with Scott Edwards from the Audubon. And I think even the um, GoFundMe is still open for um, donations and support of uh, bringing more diverse uh, diversity into the field of evolutionary biology. And as we've had some conversations about that, uh, sort of sorely um, topic that needs some some real attention and some real resources behind it. Okay, so that's sort of my preview. I'm going to um, uh, hand off the baton here to you, Vincent, to start um, introducing us to Florian and his pathway through science. 
All right, so we'd love to hear how you ended up uh, here in, in Utah, but let's go all the way back to the beginning, Florian, where where you were born and, and educated originally. Yeah, so I grew up in the uh, Bavarian mountains uh, mm. in a very uh, picture, picturesque uh, scenery on the fringes of a small village uh, called Oberammergau, which is uh, both I've been uh, there. very scenic. You've been there, really. Have you seen the Passion Play? So they're famous for this. Yeah, passion when play I was young, ten my, years. When I was uh -huh. young, my parents uh, took me. I'm sorry, I didn't appreciate the play, but I really, uh -huh. I was there. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Florian was an actor in that play at one point. Really? Was, wow. Well, I was a face in the crowd. Let's say that. And, um, <laughs> Uh, it was ironic because they, they have these, uh, what they call a tableau vivant. So you have to stand still for uh, while the music plays and reenact some scene from the Old Testament that counter caricatures the New Testament. And I don't know, they picked me to be in this sort of weird Egyptian outfit, although my body is not really that muscular. <laughs> it was quite a show. I mean, it was quite something. But anyhow, it's, uh, it happened this year because it, it was supposed to happen in 2020. And um, yeah, it's a great a great show. And so I grew up there and, uh, you know, we were, my, my dad especially was a big outdoors guy. He was a hunter. Um, and, uh, you know, so he always took me out and uh, the love for animals and for nature was just uh, inevitable. We had foxes coming to our garden. We had deer coming into our garden. Uh, we had lots of little, you know, tame ducks and uh, I was at a tame crow at a point and, and things like that. So there was clearly this, you know, outdoorsy thing. But biology really never occurred to me as a thing. I mean, we had it in school and unfortunately I went to a school that was very much, it was a Christian school, a monastery school um, that was very much focused on languages and old languages and so on. And our biology teaching, though we had nice teachers, we didn't really, you know, you didn't really get a feeling for, for the biology. Uh, not in the case like uh, then uh, some people I met at the university. And so my, my initial thing was to study medicine, but then I worked in the hospital for a while during the German civil service, which is when you don't go to the military. So I wasn't too interested in that. And then uh, a friend of my family actually said to me, you know, you, you should really study, study biology instead of medicine. And I thought, yeah, actually, you know, that's a good idea. <laughs> And so I ended up there and uh, I was not a big science, you know, I was never so much into natural sciences in school because of that bend of the school. But I was always interested in how the natural work, world works and how it, how it occurs. And then so naturally I, I leaned towards more the organismal, outdoorsy, ecological kind of science. So the idea of... Um, being in a lab and so it didn't appeal at all to me and I did a bunch of worked in a bunch of projects you know catching uh, flies from from rivers and uh, tracking a roe deer in the mountains in in northern Italy and so on and that really changed dramatically when I bought the Alberts uh, the book molecular biology of the cell and I read that from cover to cover uh, during the semester break in Germany and worked my way through that book and thought, okay, it's really inside the cell where, where you got to look if you understand, if you want to understand this, the, what it's all about, you know. And then I, I became really fascinated by this. I said, this book really was a, uh, such a revelation and uh, such a, it's such a fantastic book. And then I came across an article in a German newspaper that was talking about a German researcher who is working out how out of an egg an embryo forms using fruit flies. And it was accompanied with her beautiful, she has like simple drawings and I, I thought these drawings look so fascinating. And it didn't even occur to me that this is something you could even tackle how how do you go about that figuring that out and how does that even work and um, this woman is uh, Christiane Nusslein Vollhardt who um, uh, is a famous uh, later on went on to win the Nobel Prize and so I really became fascinated with this field of developmental biology and so that's where I did my undergraduate uh, sort of thesis in Germany. Um, I did that with a guy who was a former PhD student uh, from uh, Jan Indusland Vollhardt's lab. 
and we worked on a, on a kind of weird beetle. So we did developmental biology, a kind of comparative sort of, this was the early days of this field called Evo Devo, where um, people were comparing uh, development in different kinds of insects that have different sort of mechanics. And so we did, we did that. And then I was really excited at that time, the zebrafish issue came out uh, of development. So they did a big genetic screen for developmental mutants in zebrafish. And I, I also remember seeing that issue and I thought, wow, this is awesome. That's what I want to do. <laughs> so I applied to Yanni's lab as a, you know, just out of the blue. And there I was. Uh, she said, okay, come over here. And so I had to pack up and move to this small town of Tübingen, which uh, didn't appeal to me very much. But, uh, you know, it was a wonderful uh, lab. It was a fantastic lab. I mean, it was just, you know, a bunch of people from all over the world. And what was great was because the zebrafish was such a fresh field at the time, you know, all the people came from different backgrounds. We had uh, people from mouse, from flies, from frogs, from worms. So there was an enormous amount of uh, expertise from different developmental systems there. And uh, it was just a really, really, really great time, a really good, um, a really good crew of people. And so Am I talking too long or uh, if you want to interrupt? It's fantastic. Uh, yeah. So this was your, Florian, this was your PhD studies you're talking about now? And that, that was then my PhD. And there I picked a stupid project. And that was really uh, because I was so fascinated by pattern formation and also my former boss who I worked with as an undergrad, he was a student also of Hans Meinhardt, who had done all these models, these Gera, Gera Meinhardt models and based on Turing models originally of pattern formation. And the zebrafish offered some great ways of studying that, namely because they're called zebrafish because they're striped. And this striped pattern, interestingly, there's interesting mutants that alter that striped pattern in a very interesting way. So some of them make the stripes wider, in some of them uh, the stripes don't really separate properly. There were all these interesting mutants. The most interesting one is, of course, one, it's a single mutant that transforms the stripes into spots. <laughs> and it's a really neat, you have a really neat allelic series, you know, the stripes, they get wavy and then they get spotty. And yeah, so that's exactly what a Turing model would predict, right? And I thought this would be so cool if we could figure this out, what these molecules are, what, what does that? And uh, how that is implemented in a Turing pattern, that would be awesome. But, you know, I didn't really think about the practicalities that these... You know, uh, working with adult zebrafish, all the advantages of the zebrafish are really gone because, you know, the fast development is great for the 24 hour or two day larva, but then you have to wait till the adult pattern comes. It's almost like working with mouse, you know, it takes about two to three months till you see anything and so on. So it was a tough project, you know, and um, it came with a lot of frustration and so on. And the cloning of the genes was not so straightforward as we thought. The genome was not coming along as, as nicely as we thought. So, you know, it didn't go all the way to that dreamy discovery. And, you know, it's interesting. So now these genes have been cloned. Their function is not really clear. So some of them are connexin subunits. The others are uh, uh, potassium channel subunits. So how that really works, how this phenotype comes about from this gene is still not clear. There's all sorts of theories around possibly even that some kind of electric signaling is going on or so between the pigment cells, but no one knows. But you somehow got a PhD? That, yeah. I did get a PhD. Yeah. I mean, I published <laughs> a nice paper where, you know, I did a lot of very classical experiments, you know, uh, sort of transplantation experiments and so on. This, this is the kind of stuff you can do with fish. Um, not so much molecular, high-end uh, genomic biology. But, you know, at the end of the PhD, I was a bit worn out. And um, I felt like I put my saddle on a bit of a crazy horse. <laughs> and then all the things that appealed for me as a postdoc, you know, there was at the time David Kingsley came up with this stuff. And I thought that's really the stickleback genetics. And then I thought, am I going to saddle another crazy horse like that? I don't know. I mean, how many, how many such rides can you take? And, 
And I had always been interested in writing and I sort of morphed into a little bit the copy editor for the lab and a lot of people gave me their papers to copy edit and so on. And then there was this advertisement from Current Biology looking for an editor. And it was really out of a whim uh, that I thought, you know, why not check an alternative career just for laughs, you know, just apply there. I mean, they're not going to take you. You have a, you're a German dude, uh, they want someone with postdoctoral experience, they don't want someone who's not a native English speaker with a thick accent and so on and so forth. But, you know, I went there to the interview and uh, our assistant, our longtime assistant, Mary, she still remembers to this day how I come, came up for the interview and sh shook her hand and she says, my hand was hurting so bad afterwards <laughs> after your handshake. <laughs> But, you know, somehow they offered me the job and um, I was in a position and I thought, let's just give it a shot. Let's, okay, let's just give it a shot. And this was mm. nearly 20 years ago. Wow. And I've been there ever since. Wow. Yeah, it, so the, uh, first, yeah. the first position, where were you working? In Tübingen still? Yeah, I was still in Tübingen. So I only had two jobs in my life, so to say. I mean, yeah, apart from other odd jobs that I worked, but uh, uh, yeah. And uh, it's been a, a very lucky, I've been very lucky because we have a great team there. The journal is, uh, the, edit, the editor-in-chief, Jeffrey North, is a, you know, I cannot say enough about how fantastic he is. Uh, not just as an editor, but also as a, you know, mentor and manager. And he gives you the freedom that you want and lets you develop. And the journal really is so broad that it never got boring. You know, and that's also, I think, part of that what appealed to me in this job is that I'm not such a great focus person. You know, I'm a bit scattered all over. So it's, it's, it's quite nice to have this breadth. And, you know, I started out as a developmental biologist and I handled mostly developmental biology. But over the years, it all morphed into all sorts of different fields. And so now I'm doing mainly, uh, and in the beginning, we didn't get many of those, you know, papers in evolutionary biology or ecology. And uh, so the, the journal morphed more into this, into these other fields. And I grew alongside with that. And so that's been really fun, you know. Yeah, well, and Florian, you know, you call this an alternative career. But I think if we kind of step back and do the numbers, I would say you've been pursuing a career in science. And if we think about sort of the academic path that uh, Vincent and I took, that's sort of the alternate career in some <laughs> sense. I think, you know, it's like that's <laughs> it's kind of one of my crusades is I want to, when I, you know, when we see a seminar from a professor is to stamp it with alternate career day when you see the flyer up there instead of the other way around. Because, you know, most careers in science aren't strictly as a professor in academics, there's all of this breadth of, of um, paths. And I think maybe what's especially interesting to me is what you mentioned about that sort of ability to sample sort of broadly. Um, is that, would you say like current biology is unusual as a journal that you have that opportunity or? I think it is because, you know, we started out, it started out very much as a molecular biology, cell biology journal that was basically founded by some renegade editors from Nature, um, who for various reasons defected from the mothership and uh, started off this new sort of enterprise. And they really built on their connections they had there from the molecular biology crowd and so on. And then the journal became kind of uh, well known because... Uh, under Jeff's leadership, the, there was a real commitment to fast uh, review process. So they would often get papers that were, you know, the competing paper was at Cell or, or, or Nature or something. And uh, the, the second group came to Current Biology and said, can you help us out? Uh, we're risking being scooped and so on. This was all for preprints and so on, of course. Um, and so they made kind of a name for for themselves in this in this uh, in this manner, and then so from there out it slowly grew out. But we've always been a fairly small team, you know. At the beginning it was two or three editors, and then uh, now we're six editors. But we're a small team, and that means that you have to cover a fairly broad range. Whereas you know when you're in a team of twenty editors, they have dedicated editors for only RNA. Uh, biology and uh, you know this so i think it's a little bit unusual in in that way and it's also we've not been afraid of that breadth because the in the, the normal impulse would be you know what the hell do i know about dinosaurs 
really nothing. I mean, uh, you know, and I get these dinosaur papers. But to me, that's then the, the, the part of the job of an editor uh, is then to, you know, first of all, you educate yourself about that field. Uh, of course, you read, and but also you build the community. You know, you build a connection with the community. You get to know the people. You get to know the inner workings of that field a little bit, and you know, slowly and truly, you can you can build connections there. And so that's that. I think is to me the, the fun in that job, you know. And I don't think I would have lasted uh, in that job uh, just looking at developmental biology from <laughs> from so 2003 you, um, till now. So I'm I'm curious of exactly. I presume, aside from doing special issues like this one, you've also handled reviews of papers, right? Is that something you did from day one? I also handle papers, yeah, yeah, yeah. From day one, first day into the, from some big names that scare you, and then you have to write them an email that the paper is rejected. And it's like, oh, God. It's, you know, oh, you, feel, you feel terrible. But this was also Jeff's thing. You have to stand, you know, this is it. You're in the fire now. There's no, there's no kitchen, uh, no, no pre-kitchen or something here. You're in the kitchen and you cook. And so that was from day one. And, but that's also, I think, what, to what Nell said, what, what makes the appeal of current biology so much, because we have so much front matter. So we publish a lot of reviews, a lot of these short format articles and a lot of these news and views types articles. So handling that, which also in like nature is done by uh, dedicated editors who are more like newspaper editors almost. And so doing that is also fun because that gives you a way of being a little bit creative. You know, you can say, oh, this is an interesting paper I want to flag up or this is an interesting uh, research topic that I think should be covered more or deserves a bit of light or so. So that gives you also that little bit of that power, uh, not power, but, you know, creativity and, and, and way of steering it a little bit. And I think that's what I see a little bit as the role of such a journal like Current Biology. You know, I, I see very much our role as a sort of, you know, like an art gallery. We want to showcase a little bit interesting science that is not necessarily already on the radar of the mainstream. You know, we don't need the 15th a single cell RNA seq paper or the the, the 25th uh, stem cell paper when that was that that was the big hype when I started everything was stem cell stem cell we didn't end up publishing that much but we published some weird stuff about dung beetles or or desert ants how they get around and so on um, and it's interesting because right now I'm at a meeting uh, here in Janelia that deals with the insect central complex that has now budded into a, a paradigmatic thing in neuroscience uh, that is so spectacular. And it all started out with weird stuff of desert locusts and desert ants orienting themselves. How do they know? How do they find their way home after a long path? You know, they go a wiggly path and then they decide I'm running back to the nest and they make a straight way home to the nest. How do they do that? You know, such a simple question in a sense and that has budded into a field of neuroscience that is great and we've I think helped in this a little bit you know and um, so that's what no, I like about that. Yeah so. it's really interesting Florian I mean I think current biology kind of captures you know the the imagination of a scientist it really fosters that curiosity creativity and sort of acts to sort of renew that which is um, so valuable, I think, for a lot of scientists. But so you mentioned that you're at Genalia Farm, so at the HHMI um, Hart Hughes Medical Institute campus for a meeting. And I guess that belies the idea that editors of journals just sort of hide behind computers um, in the shadows or something like that. You're out there conducting science, it sounds like, at a meeting. So is that pretty I'm not for- conducting science, no. So this is something, <laughs> it's interesting. We always have the discussion in the, in the office and there's something Jeff also, and I totally agree with that, you know, the editor is not really a scientist, you know. We're not producing science in the same way and we're not beholden to the same code and so on. We are an outside entity, but I also believe firmly, you know, because there's all this talk about how can this, you know, Sometimes people say this is a failed postdoc. How can he judge my work of genius, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I had that. People writing to me, I've looked up this guy's publication record. What the hell? I mean, how dare he write me a rejection letter? But this is, I think it's 
good that there is an outside component in this whole game. Like, right when you have a, a book critic, a literary critic, it's not necessarily himself or herself a good writer, you know, but maybe the writer needs a perspective that's not just from their reader or from the outside, from other writers, but maybe it's some outside who doesn't have a, a stake in the game. You know, I think that is quite important to have that sort of perspective. That's what I'm trying to, to do there, you know. And yeah, yeah. Of no, course, no, I, I have people come here, people come here to me and they're like, why did you, re why did you reject my paper? I mean, it's madness. <laughs> why did you do that? And I'm like, yeah, you know. Yeah, so, that's a lesson. So, Go ahead, Vincent. I have a question that kind of relates to that. And so the problem with peer, I mean, you, you basically say we need peer review and you, you need it for grants, you need it for papers, but it's got a problem in that usually the experts are your competitors, right? And so they often want to delay you or, and you know, we have stories of nature papers being a year in review, which is Really crazy, right? So how do you balance this? Is that something you think about or you just let it play out the way it is? No, we think about it a lot, of course. And, uh, you know, I experience it uh, firsthand how difficult it is now. And I think after the pandemic, even more so, uh, it's getting harder and harder uh, to find people to review. You know, and of course, you don't always want to use the same people uh, for obvious reasons of bias and 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 things like that. And so, you know, I'm constantly cold calling, cold emailing, so to say, new people. Especially since we get a lot of, I get to handle a lot of papers in fields that I'm not super familiar with. You know, when I get a developmental biology paper or a fly neuroscience paper, I know. I have a pool of 25 people that I can call up in my mind and just email them. But, you know, if it's something about food security in, in aqua, aquaculture or something, I'm not so versed in that. I have to do some do Googling and some digging. In terms of the personal biases of the reviewers, this is just something you have to be aware of. And in, in terms of, you know, um, uh, we as... Uh, so in terms of holding off uh, work, you know, we, we just impose on people a fairly strict uh, time limit. And we say, look, guys, I mean, you cannot sit on this paper for weeks on end when nothing is happening. And, and rather tell me ahead of time if you don't have time to do it. And then that's fine, you know, or if you want to bail out, but don't go silent for uh, three, three weeks. Then we just pull the plug or, you know, do something, do something about it. So we try to avoid that. Um, but, you know, there's no other way. I mean, I cannot judge the science. And it's no, also course, like Nell says, I'm not a scientist. You know, I cannot judge and I refrain from that. I mean, of course, I look at the figures and so on to make sense that I understand what's going on. But, you know, I cannot quite say whether this whatever yeah. analysis yeah, yeah, was course, done sure. correctly or something. Yeah, so. But even more important that you're at a, you know you're out there circulating at these meetings. So I'm going to stand yeah. by my idea that you're conducting science. I agree, you're not producing science. You're not an active, you know, at the bench, running experiments or doing analysis. But I think this is like you know both having a sense of what's coming up in the field, what's exciting, what's new, yeah. and then and you know just as you're saying, making those connections with people that you might draw on for their um, experience or background as new work bubbles up. I mean, this is really a vital part of moving science forward or of conducting science. I think you, you and editors at various places um, are sometimes I think underrated in how important that is for the, um, you know, for science to work actually. There's, and I think, I think to your point, is, Vincent, I mean, yeah. you know, to your point, Vincent, I mean, we do have now with these, which can be these massive delays. I mean, I'm, in publishing, I'm in the middle of some now. I think this is where preprints, at least for me, have been really yeah, um, yeah. valuable is to have, you know, to be able to at least release it and then let another process play out kind of on parallel tracks. But yeah, we're kind of in a complicated moment in um, sharing science uh, with colleagues or around the world, you know. But, you know, that's also for me the, the rationale of why I do this job is in a sense I want to give people, you know, because everybody gets so bucked down in their own field, right? Necessarily so. You need to specialize to be a successful scientist in your field. But 
That's interesting. Just this morning was a talk about dung beetles from Marie Dacke, who is a very famous neuroethologist studying dung beetles, right? And what does the dung beetle do? Well, the dung beetle has his eye on the ground and pushes the, the dung ball. But from time to time, the dung beetle needs to check whether it's going in the right direction. So it climbs onto the dung ball and does this little orienting dance and checks out the, the scenery, goes back down, remembers the bearing and then sort of goes in a simplified sort of manner. And I think that's a little bit what I see our role as we're, we're this moment in this dance phase. You know, we showcase people a little bit the landscape of science. You know, when you're in a transition, say, to, so you're moving as from your postdoc, you want to think about what you want to do in your lab, or uh, like Nels, you made a big career step, and then you want to think what, what's, what's next, you know, and you want to know a little bit what's out there to study and what are interesting developments. And therefore, I believe it's firmly important that we talk across the fields a little bit, you know. And like here in neuroscience, it's sometimes so frustrating you know, the, the, this fly neuroscience has reached a level of sophistication that was unthinkable 10 years ago. They had this meeting about the central complex, the first one they had in 2008, and they were talking about it, and they said, in the 2008 meeting, the main question was, what is the central complex doing? Nobody knew what it does. There were all sorts of ideas around it. Now they know how it works. You know, they figured out the wiring to the cell. It's, it's, it's staggering. Yet the vertebrate field and the rodent field is very, you know, there's a big gap in between. And so, you know, bridging this gap, that's sort of what I see our role as a little bit. That's great. So I think we've settled it, Vincent. Editors of journals are the basically dung beetles, it turns out. <laughs> 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 yeah, we do well, shovel a lot of shit, that's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. We could, yeah, sure. We could keep talking in this space for a long time, but I think we should... Um, pivot now and get down to the details here. So we've got you this beautiful special issue in current biology just released as we re will release our recording on birds. And so Florian, why an issue on birds? That's a very good question. Um, it's a bit unusual for us because in the sense, you know, we usually, this, these special issues are, uh, they're always thematic in a sense, and but often the themes were very abstract. You know, we did something about the evolution of sex or sex in general or uh, sociality. I mean, we always try, we also had very focused ones on very hardcore, because we still do a lot of hardcore cell biology and so on. So we had one on membranes and so on that was, uh, you know, very mechanistic, very strong. And I just thought, I mean, it, it comes also from, I like birds, you know, uh, interestingly, really, it was moving to the US that opened me uh, for birds, uh, much more than as a, I didn't bird much when I was at home, you knew kind of what was around, but because America has just such a fantastic uh, bird life, really rich uh, uh, diversity of birds. And, um, you know, just the amount of birds you see, uh, is just staggering. So I, I, I love birds. And I thought it would be interesting to have such a taxonomic slice. We've never done it, you know, and, and because birds are such a well understood part of the biosphere, you know, I mean, evolution, Darwin's finches, the pigeons that he looked at, you know, birds. Uh, wherever you look, you know, uh, some of the most interesting neuroscience comes from the songbird, uh, 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 zebra finch. Uh, uh, song circuits, uh, very interesting neuroarthology, how do the owls binaural hearing, uh, you know, all the way down to ecology, to, to mating systems, to uh, sexual selection, all the way to, uh, there's just so much uh, aerodynamics, uh, the biomechanics of flight and, and, and things like that. So I thought, that's a great way of slicing across all of biology without being completely disparate because it's always a bird, right? And sort of slightly deeper for me, you know, this almost sounds a little bit, you know, uh, 
philosophical or so. I think we have a real problem in our world uh, at the moment is that we're losing a little bit of touch uh, with with nature and under, you know with both nature and science we're losing touch in the sense that not with the journals but with the concepts uh, in the sense that we, we really don't know what we're losing uh, as our uh, natural world is degrading and it's very hard to convey to people abstract concepts like this is an ecosystem function that is also beneficial for you and you need this because of climate change and carbon capture and all these things. Very complicated, you know, you need a lot of explaining to do. If you tell people that there's only 30% fewer birds than there used to be before, that's something people can relate to. That's something they probably experience every day. You know, many people have bird feeders and they see what comes. My mother has no idea about ornithology by any stretch of the imagination, but she notices what kind of species shows up at her bird feeder and when and so on. So birds are a great way of getting that connection with nature, you know. And yeah, I agree. So Let, you know, that was sort uh, of the thinking. There's a, from one of these articles, I don't remember which one, there's a quote at the end which says, we have messed up the living world so much that we don't understand it properly anymore. And that's relating to what you're saying here. But that's just so powerful, right? That's, uh, I cannot comment on that because that's, I wrote that. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, that, yeah, it is in relation to this thing. <laughs> it, is in, it is in the relation to this uh, idea, you know, that there uh, there have been so many extinctions already of the birds that we don't see certain evolutionary patterns anymore because we've wiped out all these birds. And you can say, of course, okay, who cares about some bird on a remote island in, in, in the South Pacific when there's five other islands, each with their own birds next to it. So, you know, okay, Di diversity lost, but, you know. But, you know, Actually, these are all data points in understanding important evolutionary patterns. Of course. And so yep. we're wiping out all these data points to a degree that we're not seeing the actual distribution anymore. So it is kind of like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I think that's what in part we try to do here on Tuivo because you're right. If you said, <clears throat> if you just went to anyone on the street and talked about losing a bird on an island, they would say, who cares? I have my own problems, right? But, and they're right. But we have to make the point of why, and you do too as a journal editor, why it's important, as you have just said, to have those data yeah. points. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and important for thinking about evolution too. So, um, you know, as we've discussed on many episodes, I mean, most of evolution is what you can't see, what's gone extinct, what's been lost. And we just see sort of this, you know, not even the tip of the tip of the iceberg around us and sometimes right. get distracted or assume that that's where all of the action is when in fact it's been really all over the map. And so I guess um, I'm just trying to get in a cliche, the idea that birds are in this context are sort of the canary in the coal mine um, it, around the world. But so specifically in that primer, you're talking about the, about flightless birds. And so maybe Florian, take us a little bit into that. Why that's an interesting, why would, I mean, I guess, you know, why, why do birds lose the ability to fly and why is it important to think about that or study that? Uh, again, this goes back a little bit to a personal, I just have this personal interest a little bit in the evolution of loss. And I don't know where it really comes from. I mean, I'm not a particularly uh, negative person or so on. But, you know, it's a very, uh, or Nels might differ actually when we talk uh, about <laughs> politics. But, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, it's actually a pattern that is very widespread on all sorts of levels, right? So I mentioned earlier David Kingsley, uh, who did this beautiful work on sticklebacks that come from the ocean, recolonize some lakes, and they lose certain parts of their body armor. One doesn't exactly know why, but, you know, this is an evolutionary loss. But this was one of the rare instances where people could really see evolution, morphological evolution happening in action almost in real time over the scale of a couple of thousand years. There's the cave fish that lose their eyes and their, their, their things. So, so a lot of these examples on the small scale are examples of loss. But then also if you look at the much deeper phylogenetic range, for instance, in the, you know, things like nematodes and so on, they have lost a lot of what was considered the toolkit, the basic gene kit of, of the, the basic bilaterian animals. So also on this deep level, you know, there's a lot of loss 
all over evolution. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? There is a, an inherent economy in that because you have a mutations that just happen. And if something is not worth keeping around, it will just wither and erode away. I mean, that's just, that's just an inherent streamlining process. Lose it or you, uh, how is it? Uh, use it or lose it or, you know, something like that. And so I find it interesting because we think always about evolution is progress and getting better and, and things get better and which, you know, in a large scale they do, of course. Yeah. But um, I like this sort of other side of evolution and that's why I was in, and Flightless birds in that context I find super interesting, right? Because flight is what makes the bird. It's, that's arguably what gave, gave rise to this great radiation of birds that we've seen since the Mesozoic and that what opened up a whole new way of life for these animals. So why do some birds give up that flight? And it turns out it's actually quite common, you know. When, when birds and certain birds who find themselves on islands and there's no predators around for them, they're quite ready to give up flying. And even, and even if they're not becoming flightless bird, interestingly, even if they're uh, flying birds still, they become also less good at flying. So their wings get a bit shorter, a bit rounder and so on. So there's a whole trend towards that, that loss of flight. And you see that in the every day, you know, you see a, a bird on the ground, you know, sometimes a, a robin or something, it'll hop a long time before it, or the California quail, for instance, that we have in our garden, uh, you know, it'll take a long time be, be, before they take to the air. They'll run as long as they can. And at some point they decide, okay, now I'm gonna start out. So there's an interesting connection with behavior, where a sort of behavioral choice almost and I don't know if I was really able to encapsulate that, uh, encapsulate that properly in the article, but there's a real link with behavior where a behavioral change gives rise over the longer term to an evolutionary change. And then some of these birds, you know, they lose their, they lose their wings. And, and some of these birds then also are freed from the constraint that they have to grow, that they have to stay at a certain size limit so they can fly. So some of them grew ginormous, right? They were like three meter tall, 700 kilogram killer birds running around that ate little, uh, you know, little piglets. I mean, it's, so it's just, yeah, I love that topic. <laughs> there's, a, there's a picture in, in one of these articles, right, of these yeah. huge, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Here it is. Scary, Voracious no? forush yeah. hashids. <laughs> Forest russets, yeah. These, yeah. these so-called, what they call the terror birds. I mean, these guys, I mean, you don't want to meet him in the, in the field, you know. You, you'd, you'd, you'd take a run for that. I mean, and these birds the could fly? These could fly? The cassowa, no, they could not. No, no, no. No. Okay. no, you can only fly till about, I, I want to say, like, something like 35 kilos or so is the heaviest flying bird, if I'm not even, or even less, I'm not even sure. But um, the cassowary, for instance, right, this is the, also a flightless bird, is considered almost the deadliest, it's the deadliest bird, absolutely. Uh, they kick people and they can kick you so bad that you die. You know, there's cases, they, they, people like to keep them because they're very pretty, but uh, so they, they, <laughs> they are fierce. <laughs> how, long, how long does it take to lose something like flight? How many years are we talking about? We don't know that so well, but we know that uh, it happens uh, uh, quite rapidly. So there, there was a, one interesting case in the, in, the, um, in the Indian Ocean where there was an island. And so one, one, one group of birds is the rails that is absolutely, they are just ready to drop flying. And rails are, of course, already uh, very terrestrial walking birds. Um, so they have already good legs. You need good legs, right? So, for instance, uh, <laughs> passerines, which have poor legs, very only there's only one case where a passerine was a was a flightless bird. And so these rails lived on this island. And uh, during the Pleistocene, when sea levels rose, the island it was like a coral, a tall island that got inundated. So everything got wiped off the island. And uh, I think this was about 100,000 years ago or something. Um, and then the same 
parent species recolonized that island and evolved to be flightless again on that same island. And so it, the, the idea is that it goes that it goes fairly fast, you know. And Hawaii is another great example where, you know, these new island chains always come up and uh, island chains come up um, over millions of years and so on. There And there you see new colonizations and a lot of those birds also were flightless. Yeah, so I think a couple of key concepts in here, kind of thinking about this from through the Tuivo lens, one being repeated losses, so the convergence. If something keeps happening independently, there's probably some biological meaning in that, that that's possible or, or sort of is repeated. And then also, you know, I think maybe modifying what you said a little bit uh, a few minutes ago, Florian, maybe not evolution as sort of a pinnacle of progress and advancement, but even like make, like short-term term gains that turn out to be mistakes if you don't want to go extinct. So, you know, this idea that most of these flightless birds are gone now, they're extinct. So you, like you're, as you're saying, you got on an island with no predators, but then guess who showed up with some predators in tow, humans with their rats, for example, and then these species that have gone down that path, that evolutionary path for that short-term advantage to um, give up some of the baggage that comes with flying are now sort of, yeah. are sort of like, you know, the feast for the predators that show up. So as the environment changes, you have these like massive extinctions. Really kind of illustrating and, the complexity. Uh, New Zealand, I mean, New Zealand is the key example there, right? I mean, New Zealand had uh, a vast diversity of flightless birds and it's almost all gone, you know, including the giant moa, that were, you know, gigantic birds and they vanished very fast as soon as humans came there, right? They were just not used to this kind of predation. They, were, they had predation from another bird, from an eagle, but, you know, they were ad adapted to that somehow. They managed with that, but this two other two-footed predator was not good for them. Yeah, no, really interesting. So maybe I'll... Um now move to that review that we mentioned sort of at the top, which is the genomic adaptation or the genomic landscape on which these adaptations are happening. So can you, actually, I'm curious just from a bigger picture, Florian. So when you're putting together a special issue like this, in this case on birds, do people just like show up with reviews and articles in the inbox or how does it, how does this work? How does a special issue come together? Mm, well, you know, uh, we we then get together as a team. We, we first, uh, you know, we the first decide on what the topic is. So somebody, I like, I pitched that idea to the team, and then they said, "Oh, this is a great idea." And then we sort of come up with what could be interesting topics, right? And that, in the case of birds, is of course uh, difficult, right? You you can do everything, and a lot of ground we have not covered, right? We don't have anything about the digestive system, which is also super interesting, and you know. There's not every, you cannot just cover everything. Um, but in this case, I thought, um, so we actually got quite a few papers on, on these sorts of things, on adaptations and, and, and general genomics of birds. So there's also a lot of interesting stuff going on with hybrids, uh, uh, the different, um, you know, the, a lot of like these warblers that hybridize and then you can see how certain uh, certain coloration loci segregate in the hybrid uh, cross, um, and that's all occurring natural and so on. And so, so we got a fair. I, I had a feeling uh, we got a fair uh, number of these uh, papers, and so we had a good grasp of the field. And then I thought it would be interesting again doing this taxonomic slice because then these. Examples are then often discussed in the context where people talk about genomics of adaptation in general, and then people talk about the deer mouse and uh, and, uh, and the sticker back and so on, and then there's also a bird in there. And I thought it would be actually interesting to slice this now around the birds. And because the birds also have interesting genomic features, like these, these germline chromosomes, and they have a different sex chromosome system and so on, so, um, yeah, I thought this, uh, I thought it was quite interesting and I thought yeah, it turned out quite well, actually. I, yeah. yeah, I agree. And so did you, yeah. um, invite then Toes? Yeah, and then I, I wrote to, to Dave Toes. I knew him uh, from, you know, we met at a meeting and I knew him from way before and he's, uh, I thought he was, he wrote, a, I know he can write, uh, um, and so I thought, yeah, this, this would be good. And then these things get reviewed. So the reviews get actually sent through a peer review and it was very well received. And so that was all, that was all good. Yeah. And so this I'm review happy. is really fascinating, um, Vincent, you know, so when we, when it's sort of, um, 
I don't know, evolution is not a blank slate in a sense. Like the organization of genomes matter for as mutations bubble up and arise, how natural selection might act on that. And so you mentioned, Florian, like, for example, the sex chromosomes in some of that arrangement. How does that influence, like, the sort of adaptive process? And, and are, are birds totally unusual in this way? Or do they, can they teach us about other sort of evolutionary pathways that we might see in our own species or, or other diversity around us? Yeah, then now you're asking me to go out on a limb of uh, unknowingness. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, they have a, they have a, so in, in birds, the simple thing is they have uh, the females are the heterogametic sex, so it's inverted to what the situation is in, in mammals. So they have a, a ZW chromosome system. And then the passerine birds have these very weird chromosomes. They have these germline restricted chromosomes where the female have two copies of them and, uh, and the males have only one. And that's found in all passerine birds. And um, they basically disintegrate in the in the somatic cells, and they're only present in the in the germline. And no one really knows what they do. There's there's a lot of repetitive sequence. So some people thought initially that they were uh, selfish uh, elements or something like that. But there are also genes on there, and some people think that maybe this is something for germline maintenance or germline function. Uh, um, you know, it's not really clear. What certainly where I think and where I hope that we're seeing more in the bird space is really uh, sexual selection, right? Because the assumption is a little bit uh, that birds, because they are sort of, you know, uh, occasionally uh, there's a lot of examples where there's strong sexual selection. You know, if you think about uh, birds of paradise or very colorful birds like this morning, I saw a cardinal there, you know, you think there's a really red bird sitting in the bush. I mean, how much more attention can you draw to yourself? Yet <laughs> this clearly is enhances fitness, you know. So what is this? And we actually have a paper out this week. Um, it's on the cover this week. So we have another bird cover. Um, which is about the biochemistry of these carotenoid pigments, you know. And it, so the question is, how does this get selected for? Well, and how is it selected that it actually can bring fitness? And that's, of course, because it's somehow related to the condition of the bird. So it's somehow a so-called honest signal of quality, you know, whatever that means. But it means that, you know, the offspring has a better chance of survival. So the female, when she picks a very red male, she get a better chance of her own fitness increases with that. And these are, this is all linked through the diet, right? Because the precursors for this uh, thing is, uh, for this pigment is ingested by the diet. So it shows this guy is a good forager, very simply put, yeah, uh, in very simple terms. But I think this kind of angle, and because we don't really have a good grasp of how sexual selection acts on the genome and, and what the sort of, you know, genetic underpinnings is, whether it all works the same way as natural selection, just stronger or something like that. Uh, but I think that's quite interesting. Yeah, I totally agree. And speaking yeah. of colors, I mean, we've gone almost an hour here and Vincent, we haven't oh. even mentioned vi viruses yet, which is like yeah, yeah. Um, unusual for us, but some really cool stories related to egg shell color. Um, that actually involve some of these selfish genetic elements or even endogenous retroviruses that can influence the expression of genes that then sort of link to metabolic pathways that then are involved in putting some of the pigment in the eggs. And then maybe, you know, to get to some of your points here, Florian, about how this then connects to what's happening in nature or signals, maybe some dishonest signaling where some of the egg patterns, like of cuckoos, that fool... Uh, uh, another bird to take on the cuckoo's offspring as their own, you can start to draw these long lines all the way from those molecular changes, in this case, the viruses that are just hopping around, um, replicating themselves, that then can, you know, sort of at these other layers of biological organization can end up influencing whether a bird will be convinced to raise a species that's not even its own. I mean, it's, that to me is really one of the fun stories that sort of draws this all together. That's just mind boggling, right? I mean, to you you go, if you've ever seen a picture of a cuckoo uh, uh, hatchling in a, in a, in the nest of a reed warbler or something like that, 
you think, how can that bird not see that this is a monster? It's like three times the size of its own chicks and it feeds it. <laughs> and yet that same bird, that same bird is able to tell apart the eggs of the cuckoo, which you could not tell apart. I, I, I think the human is hard pressed to tell apart what is the cuckoo egg and what is the bird egg. And the bird egg, kicks it out, you know, and, and then there's other cuckoos where it's the other way around, where the eggs look completely different and the chicks match because those birds have learned to recognize the cuckoo chicks. So now the cuckoo chick evolves to look like the bird chick and the bird chick evolves all these weird little bristles and little uh, patches on the beak, uh, inside of the beak, so that it's really like a signal to the mother, I'm the real thing, you know. Yeah. It's, it's wow. crazy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just, yeah. This is great. Yeah. Really cool. I mean, these totally. uh, these kinds of adaptations that we've been talking about, right, the the coloration, the, the, the egg coloration, the plumage, there's also beak size, uh, elevation, where the birds live is another thing. And then the one that blew me away is taste reception. There can be sweet versus savory. And I said, how the hell do you know <laughs> if there's sweet versus savory? In a, how do you, do you know how you figure that out, Florian? Well, you can test the receptors in, in an in vitro system, right? Oh, so you can clone out the receptors and you can put them in a frog oocyte and then stimulate that. I mean, it might make it sound very easy, but it's not that easy. I see. And you can also predict a little bit on sequence and... So yeah, some birds have, have, have gained that ability. And it's interesting, we also just had recently a paper on that note. So the idea is birds in general, the basal state of birds is they don't have sweet taste, but then certain groups like colibris and other these nectar feeding birds, they evolved the sweet taste. And then there's other birds that lost it again. So like the rhinex, so they evolved <laughs> from some sort of sap feeding, nectar feeding birds, and then they lost it again you know, as they turn to feeding on insects in, 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 in the bark or so. So there's a, there's, a lot of, wow. there's a lot of really interesting stuff. And that's what I find about birds is also so great is because they are so well known, you know. So you can draw on a, on a very rich natural history and you find something for almost every question that you're interested in and you'll find an interesting bird to look at. Yeah. And well, this parallelism... Drawing. Oh, sorry, you know, this, this, what you were saying about the parallel evolution, I just thought about it this morning, you know, how, how crazy this is. I was walking in the field here looking at some birds before the meeting started and I saw these savannah sparrows, which is a very beautiful bird and it's called a sparrow, savannah sparrow. And it was called that because the European settle, settlers came here and thought, oh, this looks like a sparrow at home. But, and it does, kind of, you know, it's brown and hops around on the ground and has a sort of, you know, point you know, short, stubby beak. But it's not a sparrow at all, right? It's actually related to what in the old world is called a bunting, yeah? So it's a t totally different family in the passerines, but different family. And then you have buntings here in the US, also what's called a bunting. But that again has nothing to do with a bunting in the old world. That is then related to what you have here as the cardinals. So... Uh, even in the common names, you know, this kind of confusion and, and parallelism in evolution, you know, like these sparrows, they look like sparrows and they, they do exactly what a sparrow does in Europe, but they're actually a different kind of uh, group. So this, this parallelism is just super fascinating. I agree. You know? And that's, yeah, so. I totally agree. This is a really important point. And so this, um, I think, is really nicely drawn in the passerine birds primer by Jonathan Schmidt and Scott Edwards. And so... You know, they they point out that when you look at these birds, sparrow, sparrow-like birds, just like you're saying, Florian, that they almost look identical. I think as humans, we assume that because of that, they're closely related. But then in the DNA sequencing era, the genome era in particular, as you start to compare these things that maybe to our eye seem like closely related situations, it's that parallelism that shows up all over the place in the actual genetic connections and where that came is very different than the morphology. And so that seems like the whole field is still grappling with that, is how are these guys even related to each other? And what does that mean for the evolutionary process? What does that mean for how evolution plays out um, across these millions of years? So, yeah. And so many articles here. So even on the egg color, there's an entire review on, on bird eggs that we're not even touching on here. So big recommendation, take advantage of that 
Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of eggs in that nest. That is the <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Take advantage of this two week window where a lot can of this I, content is available. Can I uh, ask another question, Nels? Of course. So in um, I think in the, um, the this review article, um, the genomics of adaptation, it, it's uh, it's mentioned that uh, powered flight evolved three times, only three times, right? I think. Uh, they say modern birds, bats, and pterosaurs. And insects, uh, of course. And yeah, and mammals, I guess they make the. Uh, oh, in the If you're just, yeah, yeah, just looking yeah. at mammals, yeah, insects, of yeah. course, right? And um, so that, that led me to think um, so do you know who evolved it first among those? I guess the pterosaurs, right, would be the oldest? Yes, the pterosaurs are the oldest. So we don't actually, there was actually a very nice fossil this, uh, just this week that is potentially a good outgroup for a, for a pterosaur and that goes way back. Yeah? So that was way back at the, in the Triassic. They were first, then came the birds in the Jurassic. And then, uh, you know, in the, in the case of the birds, we have a very good understanding of how the, how the, how the transition looks. And, you know, you see the transitions between uh, you know, things that were probably gliding or, you know, climbing up a tree and then gliding around the tree, though, although there's also still debate or whether it was not running on the ground and gliding. And um, <laughs> But you can see that there was a, a range of different morphologies. You know, there were the Microraptor, for instance, had four wings, you know, that they had, they had, the leg, they had feathers, almost like flight feathers on their legs. So they clearly... Uh, they were maybe comparable to these gliding lizards or these gliding uh, flying squirrels, something like that. So there was a lot of experimentation. And then, yeah, the bats evolved in the sort of, I think, in the Eocene or like in the 40, 40 50 million years ago, something, something was, like that. And, you know, bats, again, show what flight, that flight is really a, 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 a evolutionary spark, a radiator, you know. Uh, bats are the, the second most specious order of mammals and uh, you know they just speciated like crazy because this flight just gives them a sort of you know an advantage uh, and a sort of freedom from predation to a certain degree uh, that, that just opens up new uh, angles of evolutionary space if one wants to say it like that. And in this Passerine article, they say that yeah. uh, the, the Passerines exemplify adaptive radiation. They've been so successful. So what we, so bats are 20% of mammals and, and rodents are 40%. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, so how do, how do we compare birds? Like a lot of species? Passerines, passerines are two thirds of all bird species. Okay. So it's an absolute, uh, you know, it's your most familiar birds, and they, they, they have radiated uh, spectacularly. But what I find super interesting, and what I kind of had not appreciated until I, I, I actually edited that piece from Scott Edwards and uh, Jonathan, uh, is that we don't really know what drove, what is it about passerines that is so special, you know? Uh, by all stretches of this, there's not really something where you can say this is a defining such as flight is for all birds, there's nothing really defining about them that gives them this, that would justify such a tremendous radiation, you know, and it is really a tremendous radiation, you know. Um, uh, some idea is that it's maybe the body size that they're in a sort of sweet spot, but then you have some very big passerines, like you look at a crow or a raven, that's, a, that's also a passerine bird, or a jay, uh, they're fairly big, right? So they, they evolved out of that niche, but maybe it's this small, uh, you know, being able to hop around between the branches of a tree and yet be very fast. Maybe it's their ability to migrate, but you know, you have migratory birds in all sorts of families, so it's not really entirely clear yeah, what yeah, which, drove that. Really interesting. I mean, they, they men, they're yeah. mentioning in this article, they're on all continents except Antarctica. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And, and uh, if that's really true, although there's some uh, evidence counter to it, they are Australia's gift to the world. Because we always think of Australia as the sort of 
continent with weird critters that all get uh, messed <laughs> up when when we connect it to the rest of the world. But the idea that birds, possibly uh, passerine birds, songbirds, came out of uh, Australia and spread over the world, I thought. And when I heard it the first time, I was also like, wow, this is so cool. Mm. You know, this yep. is unusual. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. The out of Australia hypothesis for passerines. Yeah, out, of, versus, out, of, yeah. out of Australia hypothesis. That's right. Yeah. No, really cool. And I kind of illustrate. It still holds. Yeah, illustrates. You know the um, the special issue. It's not an encyclopedia where everything is settled. It's current science that's being explored and really setting up the questions and um, like underlining all the opportunities out there for the science ahead. Like just picking up all of these great threads and possibilities in evolutionary biology in particular, but other fields as well, neuroscience and the integration of them, um, where it just sort of inspires and brings all these opportunities sort of in, into focus. I really want to make a plug that someone should study those rails, I thought, because mm -hmm. that is really uh, potentially a huge thing. You know, I mean, you have a, 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 an experiment, uh, island rails that went flightless, that's been run hundreds of times over, you know, hundreds of parallel events. I mean, the, your sample size, you can only dream of something like that. You can only do that with, a, with bacteria or, or flies or something like that, or worms. And, you know, you have possibly still bones, at least from those that went extinct, you know, they find them all the time in some mittens. And, you know, now with ancient DNA, you probably can get a genome out of there. And you can probably infer from the length of the bone how the wings were and whether they could fly. Uh, and that would be a really interesting, you know, comparative genomic study on it for someone who has, uh, you know, lots of funding and uh, fun uh, to do, like an HHMI investigator <laughs> or something like that who's looking for a new <laughs> yeah, well, topic. This, one, one thing I wanted to maybe wrap up with is... Um, the, the first, uh, the adaptation review at the end, they say, you know, we do, we make a lot of associations between phenotypes and genotypes. And in other systems, we can then go in the lab and test it. But the problem with birds is that most of the avian taxa don't do well in the laboratory. So we can't prove associations, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that's a that's a super important and super important uh, valuable point. That's true for actually a lot of the good uh, evolutionary models, right? Also in the stickleback, it took a while until they could do CRISPR then or something like that and could actually prove that these are causative variants. I think um, you know, like one person that comes to mind is Mike Shapiro, who works on domestic pigeons. So it's evolution under artificial selection, but it's still evolution. Um, who try, I think was trying very hard to push it that way to, to get to this more mechanistic uh, system. And then, of course, the chicken is a, uh, you know, tried and tested developmental uh, model system, at least for embryology. And you can do CRISPR in chickens and so on. And, you know, there's some people have been doing some mechanistic stuff, but also with these flightless birds where they, where they, uh, swapped in, uh, which I think is a super cool experiment, right? They swapped in a, a gene from the MOA, which they reconstructed. So the MOA is extinct, but we have a genome sequence, partial genome sequence at least. So we can reconstruct a gene from a MOA and can stick it into a chicken and see what it does to the limb development and so on. But unfortunately, they didn't get the result they were hoping for. But, you know, just the idea, I mean, there is a horizon for such, uh, you know, experiments. Yeah, agreed. So, and if you're interested in Mike Shapiro's work, Twivo episode seven, Pigeon Fashion Week, Feathery Boots edition, we had Mike <laughs> on <laughs> for an interview uh, about some of this biology. And I agree with you, Florian. Like, so putting together, and it's a great point, Vincent, putting together sort of the experimental possibilities to the bigger picture here, it feels like the uh, one of the big challenges. And so, you know, I'm kind of currently in the back of my mind thinking, well, which rails could you like bring into captivity or the ones that are left or do they, what are the ones with the fastest generation time or, you know, what, what's the possibility That's of domestication? A big problem. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, to move it beyond that. And so, or how can we use, you know, the, all that foothold that's been gained with chickens as a model system, you know, can some of this biology be transplanted somehow there with all of the compromises though and issues, but it just, yeah, so many cool possibilities. Thinking of speaking of cool, I'm looking now at the cover 
of this special issue in this beautiful <laughs> bright pink is this a spoonbill florian what's the story that's behind a spoonbill the yeah that's a yeah. that's a rosette spoonbill it's a, you know <laughs> it's just one of the i wanted something that kept just because birds are at the same time you know they're so familiar to us we see a bird you see a bird every day so they are a very familiar sight but uh, i'm also you know birds are there's a eerie otherness, you know, maybe captured in the Alfred Hitchcock movie. Uh, you know, there's something also quite spooky and foreign about them, right? When we look at them and the, the weird beak and we, uh, the way our face recognition system works, we always try to see uh, uh, something that's familiar to us and we try to see a face in everything, but in a bird, it's very hard to see a face. And, it's great. and that great. bird is just, you know, so, uh, you, you, and you, the feathers and the weird beak I, I i just thought it was a fantastic photo yeah i where do I, these, I, I came on uh, it on chess where do these birds inhabit they're in florida so they're actually uh, they're not uncommon you can see them in the everglades and so on i saw them when we were there a couple of years ago they're you know they're they're water feeding uh, bill, uh birds we have a we have we have a spoonbill that is also very pretty, not pink, but whitish sort of that, that is in Europe. Uh, I also saw those. But these are in Florida. It's a typical Florida bird. So if you're ever down there, just... Do you have a favorite bird, Florian? Do I have a favorite bird? That's a good question. So we had, of course, this section about the favorite bird and I, I loved... I mean, I loved crow. I love crows, and uh, just because they're so clever. I love also. I love jays, actually. So the jays are possibly my favorite family, you know. And they're. I know they're considered a bit of a nuisance here. They can be quite noisy, noisy in the wood, like as a hunter and so on. But for instance, we have in Utah the stellar jay, which is really a stellar bird, although it's called stellar, but. Uh, it's a beautiful bird. Um, we saw uh, last year we were in Mexico and I saw the green jays there, which look almost like parrots, you know, but you recognize they are jays, but they have a completely weird color. So jays, I would say, actually my sort of favorite group. How about when you, Vincent? I'm, uh, I was going to say, when I work in the garden, the blue jays are always screaming at me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> always, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, uh, they call you out. That's why hunters don't like them and so on. They, they, whenever someone's in the woods, they're the, the alarm bell of the woods. Yeah. So there was, I was in the garden once, there was a lot of jay activity. I said, what's going on? They were yelling at a hawk that was sitting in the yeah. tree. And Mobbing, they eventually yeah. chased yeah. it away because yeah. we saw the hawk yeah. leaving. Oh, that's what they were yelling at. That's so cool. Yeah. So yeah. cool. And we have in Europe these, uh, we have the, so we have a, um, uh, we have the Eurasian jay that feeds mainly on acorns, and so they are caching birds. And so they are talking about ecosystems, super important for planting new bird seeds. And we also have a, I don't know how it's called in English actually, it's a pine jay, so that lives in the pine forests higher up in the, in the Alps. And in Switzerland, uh, in the, in, uh, you can, there's whole pine forests where you go through the forest, and the succession of the forest is there's a tree and on the foot of the tree, the next tree is already growing. And that's because the jays stash their seeds under the trees and they remember where they have it, <laughs> but sometimes that's not perfect. They forget them and then a new tree grows. So that forest over the centuries, the trees stay more or less in the same spot because it's the funny. jays always put, put ah. the seeds there where there's a... Where there's a where does our tree? I mean, yeah. that's great. Birds, ecosystem <laughs> services. Yeah. Now, as you ask me a uh, favor, I don't think I could name one because hmm. there's so many cool birds, and and I don't even know it, many of the tropical birds, which you know the toucans are amazing, right? But um, I can tell you that I like, I love hawks because I love their faces, right? With the the beaks and the face, and those eyes are just intense. And there's another. We have a kind of woodpecker called the pileated woodpecker here in the northeast. Oh, they're amazing. They're really big with a huge curved neck. And the way they, and the beak is long. And the way yeah. they go at wood is just, do they hack at it? It's incredible. Yeah. 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 Incredible. Bird. I'm going gonna, yeah. to go on the record um, with my favorite bird, which is one that, Florian, you brought up in your flightless piece. It's not actually completely flightless, but the tinamous. So these are oh. South American birds. And um, I actually haven't seen them in the wild, but 
um, we have a local Tinamu family that lives here at the Tracy Aviary in Salt Lake. This is oh, cool. a really great bird um, sanctuary. Um, it also turns out it's a great place to bring a toddler. There's like playground and ice cream and things like that. It's like to perfect weekend event. But there's this family of Tinamus. So these are like kind of a ground bird, pretty, they're pretty drab. They don't have these fancy feathers or sort of intensity, but they look to me like almost like a, um, a piece of pottery from like the, like, you know, thousands of years ago, an ancient shard of pottery that's sort of walking around in this sort of understated elegance. I can't get enough of the South American Tinamu. That's my favorite. That's a great, uh, that's a great uh, thing that you mentioned that because that's also something about our special issue that I love, like the Tinamu, say. Yeah, you take that bird, which you just named, and it shows up in all different kind of contexts in the in these in this special issue. So it shows up in the flightless bird because the Tinamu is actually a ratite. It's the only ratite that can fly. So it's related to ostriches, emus, and so on. But it's it, and it's not the out group what you would normally think. There's a flying out group, the ancestral state, and the other thing. No, it's nested right in there. So clearly something else went on. It shows up there. It shows up in. Uh, when Bart Kempmers is talking about extra marital mating because they have a very weird uh, mating system. And uh, the males are guarding the nests, the females drop the eggs, and several females drop the eggs, and often it's from very different males. So a male may, may up ending guarding eggs that are not even his own. You know, completely weird. And then they also have this, I don't know if you saw that, I don't know if it's appropriate to say that, but they also have these weird penises. Uh, so they have a, you know, one of the few birds that have a penis, which may have to do with this, uh, you know, sexual selection uh, system there. So it shows up in all kinds of uh, uh, contexts. Yeah. Well, and then you also have the favorite birds of a lot of the authors and contributors in there. Were there any surprises that came out of that? Oh, there's just uh, that stuff. I mean, I, I, I don't want to show off too much, but I think this is a great. This shows exactly that, right? That a bird is something so that is where we connect, you know. And like uh, one of the, you know, the, the, the first one from Damien Farin, where he told, tells the story where he was a young student and he's ringing albatrosses and he they, they caught some albatrosses and they notice. These birds were ringed here, whatever, 20 years before in the same spot, uh, you know, and they have consecutive numbers on the rings, you know. So they're clearly coming here, you know, there's a, there's a deep uh, connection and, uh, you know, and I also love the Scott Edwards when he talks about the, the black-footed albatross, because uh, Scott is black and he's a big... Uh, uh, advocate of diversity and also the, by the way the birding community is, uh, is also a great uh, diversity promoter you know there's a lot of activity uh, black birders and and so on that is really uh, uh, doing a great job so so there's a lot of and and you know the guy who researches owls and then does experiments with the owls and their hearing and so on and after the experiments are done the owl lives with him for 20 years. <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, yeah, I love you this. You cannot kind of make the... that up. No, I mean, this is like <laughs> when I had so level. Uh, yeah. Think, yeah, cool. from the scientific to the very personal, how yeah, this, yeah. how these species really touch us as humans and then yeah, can even do. drive careers. Really inspiring. Yeah. And kind of, you know, yeah. to me, that really illustrates the kind of the magic of the journal itself, current biology or some of the ideas there. So, Vincent, you know, we've kind of naturally, kind of seamlessly moved into our picks of the week. So we've got favorite birds, um, the Tracy aviary. Um, I thought I, and, uh, Florian sort of um, broached the topic. I have my pick of the week actually relates to bird penises. So <laughs> I, wanted to, I, wa <laughs> I wanted to bring this up. Um, actually, just a totally random connection. So I was back at my old alma mater, my undergrad institution, Carleton College, a couple of weeks ago and ran into Mark McCone, who is um, evolutionary biologist there. He runs the Cowling Arboretum, which is beautiful um, sanctuary for birds and other critters in southern Minnesota, and Mark was telling me he just he has a new paper that's out. It's um, advanced online in the American Naturalist, and um, the, it's about the not the loss of flight, but the loss of penises among birds. And so, this is my pop quiz question for both of you: What percent of bird species 
have lost their penises. Well, let, Vincent, why don't you go first since um, Florian's been studying this more closely recently. What do you think? What percent have lot of bird species have lost their penises? I'm just just guessing. I have no idea how many birds have penises <laughs> or not. No idea. Um, I would say ninety percent. Ninety percent, Florian. What do you, what do you say? I'm a bit, uh, uh, okay, so did they lose them? Uh, but I thought ancestrally they didn't have them to begin with, or? Because if they're related to a, uh, like a, uh, reptiles don't have, they don't have penises. Some of them have some sort of intermittent. So I think the idea well, is the I common most, ancestors. The, the, the birds I know is the tinamu I know because of we had that discussion. And I know, of course, ducks are famous for their... Excessive uh, penises, yeah. hmm. but other than that, I cannot think of it. I mean, I I would also say, oh, ninety percent or something like yeah. that. Yeah. So Mark more, was telling me ninety-five. Very, yeah, exactly. Mark was telling me ninety-seven percent of birds have lost their penises. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which, yeah. which is sort mm -hmm. of like you know why is that? And so this paper, that's my pick of the week, um, thinks it's a, a, a competitive strategy dealing with sperm competition. So as most female birds might be mating with several males. Um, there are all of, there's this elaborate morphology, female morphology for both, you know, developing eggs and then for accepting or rejecting sperm and these storage organs, basically, where the sperm from multiple males will come together. And so the idea that Mark advances in this paper is that, um, sort of the, um, the last sperm to get into that storage organ is the one that's more likely than to move through to the uterus to fertilize the developing egg. And so the selective advantage would be the, basically the smaller the penis becomes, the more likely that sperm will ultimately wow. um, fertilize the egg. And so then this kicks off this sort of competition until the bird penis is ultimately lost. So anyway, that Nels, <laughs> Nels, there's something there for Woody Allen, I think. <laughs> That's right, exactly right. It's interesting because I thought it's the other way. And the ducks, the, th the thought is also that the ducks are such fierce, uh, yep. you know, they, they're so competitive that they have hmm. these weird penises Very interesting. to do that. Yeah. No, that's right. And so Mark has a follow-up piece that is uh, addressing that. And so this notion that, so then mating can become more, you can try to cheat if you're a male or become more aggressive. So you try to break down that system. The males take a different strategy or the ducks, the male ducks take a different strategy mm -hmm. um, and actually um, move into this really aggressive mating behavior, which would be sort of maybe an outcome of um, the elaborate morphology that the females develop. And so, I mean, that's another, I think, great example. Which then is a great, which is then also great for, for ducks because ducks are yeah, such weird, uh, they love you to hybridize. And so bird is, you know, birders really love ducks because you can see all weird hybrids floating around in nature even because the duck will mate with anything, you know. Yeah, exactly. so they have such a drive, which wow. then yeah. creates yeah, yeah. interesting evolutionary scenarios and so on and so forth. Exactly. Great science ahead there as well. Hey, Vincent, what's your science pick of the week? So I wanted to pick something with birds, right, in honor yeah. of. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going back to an episode of This Week in Parasitism from May 2016. It's called Malaria in the Bronx Zoo. And I'm not going to tell you what happens here, but it involves uh, sparrows and penguins. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Uh, and we uh, we actually went to the Bronx Zoo to uh, to record the video on this one, and the director uh, Paul Cali was part of that episode. But it turns out that the uh, some of his penguins got malaria, and they got it from sparrows that are naturally infected with Plasmodium. It's an avian species, and the birds are fine; they live with it. But they are bitten by mosquitoes who then bite the penguins and transmit it to them. And penguins do not uh, evolve in the presence of malaria, so they get sick. It's a fascinating story. I mean, they were okay. They were able to treat them and so forth. But it's just how you take a species and you bring it where it shouldn't be and, and bad things happen to it, right? <laughs> yeah. It really, it really puts the zoo in zoonosis. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> That's beautiful. Well said. I think we should end there on that high note. <laughs> That's the, that was one of my favorite uh, t 
TWIP episodes. That was a lot of fun. That looks really cool. I'm gonna, I haven't seen it. I'm going to check that out at the next opportunity. Very cool. And, you know, I, we went to, uh, we, Paul Cali got into the penguin area hmm. and he had a zookeeper. Uh, f- so he wanted to have birds walking around him all the time. They have all kinds of interesting birds with long, long beaks in this uh, penguin area. And so the lady was just feeding them fish and they stood right, in, you couldn't see her on camera, but you could see all the birds because they wanted to get the fish. It was a great strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Anyway, that's uh, that's been a terrific discussion, Flory, and I really appreciate it. I, I'm going to go look at the issue for sure. And having a Columbia University appointment, I can download the whole issue and read it myself. That's great. That's um, great. And I've learned so much just by our, our conversation and reading these three articles. So uh, I, I want to thank you for uh, for joining us today. And, and, you know, listeners, this is only like 1% of the, the whole issue. So go and, and read it. It's great. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Vincent. Thank you, Nels. This was fantastic. I, I realized I talked way too much as usual. No, no, we I, love I, it. At first it's I was perfect. worried that we don't have enough material, but, uh, yeah, it was great. I was oh, no. great fun. Listen, uh, we always want our guests to do most of the talking. That's the point of having a guest. Nels and I can talk all we want right now. <laughs> yeah. And we do that uh, we once do a that. month on our live stream. But <laughs> we yeah, do. no, That's thank great. you, Florian. So fun to see this issue come together, get some of the backstory yeah, it about it and to really just spend some time. Um, what a gift to, to look at this collection of incredibly interesting fasting biology brought together um, in this new way. And I think this will, um, you know, build into to interesting things in the future. Who knows what will happen because of this, but it's, it's, it feels like such a positive contribution. So thank you, Florian, for, and thank you for joining us. My pleasure. And uh, now it's back for me to the fly brain. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> That's Twivo 83. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash Twivo. We'll give you a link to this uh, special edition on birds from current biology. Very cool stuff. That was fun. Uh, if you uh, want to send us questions or comments, picks of the week, Twivo at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. We'd love your financial support. It doesn't have to be a huge amount. It could be as little as a dollar a month. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Nel Zeldi is at cellvolution.org on Twitter. He's LL. Excuse me. On Twitter, he's L Early Bird. Hey, that's interesting. Bird. It's in the. It's in your Twitter feed. How about that? It's in that? my Twitter feed. There it is. Yeah. A Thanks, funny Nels. story behind that that I'll discuss another time. Hey, thank you, Vincent. This is really fun. Great interview. Great recording. And looking forward to the next time we're back live streaming on Twivo. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Music you hear on Twivo is by Trampled by Turtles. They're at trampledbyturtles.com. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Till then, stay curious. Stay curious.